And sometimes it is so hard for us to really believe that our perfect father could forgive an imperfect us. But in Romans 8, 34 and 35, it says, Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? And in John 10, 28, 29, it says this, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Listen to the words of this song because it just kind of says it all. Y'all pray for me. This is new to me. A lot of us grew up believing at any moment we could lose it all. And at the drop of a hat, God might turn his back and move on. A lot of us feel like we blew it, thinking that we're just too far gone. But I want you to know there's still a hope for you now. No matter what you've done, you can't erase his love. Nothing can change it. You're not separated no matter what. There's never been a better time to get honest. There's never been a better time to get clean. So come as you are, run to the cross and be free. Oh, be free. No matter what you've done, you can erase his love. Nothing can change it. You're not separated no matter where. He's always holding on. You're still a daughter. You're still a son. No matter what. Don't know what you've been taught. Don't know what you've been told. All I know is my God will never let go of you. Never let go of You're not separated, no matter where you run. He's always holding on. You're still a daughter, you're still a son, no matter what. You're still a daughter, you're still a son. Joshua chapter 23, looking at the first eight verses, and God's going to lead us down a path this morning, I pray, that will speak to your heart in such a way that you'll look at Israel and you'll say, oh wow, I've really learned a lesson 
from them today that I'm going to apply to my life. Because God is showing us what his people in the past have done and how we can benefit from understanding what they went through. Beginning in Joshua 23. Heavenly Father, would you please bless us today as we read your word. Father, anoint it, touch our hearts, move us, Lord. Move us to respond to your word today. God, you deserve all the praise and glory. You always do every day of our lives. You sustain us, you provide for us, you bless us. God, today as we enter into worship, our purpose here today is to bless the name of Jesus. Father, we love you and we thank you for this time. It's in Christ's name that we pray, amen. Beginning in Joshua chapter 23, it says, After a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua, by then a very old man, summoned all of Israel, their elders, their leaders, judges, and officials, and he said to them, I am very old. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Remember how I had allotted an inheritance for your tribes, all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the west. The Lord your God himself will push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you, and you will take possession of their land as the Lord God promised you. Be very strong and be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, but you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. The message title today is Cling to the Lord. And I came up with about half a dozen different titles. I looked at one commentary and I was reading and it kind of gave me this idea of a title. And then I went and read something else and I got a different idea for a title. And, and ultimately I came back and read the text again. And it's all about Israel. You need to cling to the Lord. Today, we need to look at what Israel did, and we need to get this message, and here it is, we need to cling to God, amen? Verse 1 sums up the context of the verse very well, of the passage It says, Israel has acquired the land that God had promised them, and their faithful leader, Joshua, is old, and he's preparing to die. He knows he's of age, and he's getting ready to check out. He's not contemplating what death's door might hold. He's not thinking about um, what it might be to pass through death's door. He's thinking about the people that he's leaving, and he's thinking about encouraging them, and he's concerned about them. Before he steps off the scene, he has something really important to say about serving the Lord. In order to communicate what's on his heart, he calls two meetings. The first of all, such we see in Joshua chapter 23, where he deals with the elders and calls the leaders of the people. And the second is recorded in chapter 24, we'll look at later, involves all the people of Israel. He knows that a new generation is coming along that they did not see the miracles and the wonders of the Lord in their midst. They didn't experience that. Before he dies, he wants to remind them about the God that they serve. I want to stop and pray right here. I want us to be reminded about this awesome God that we serve this morning. Father, I love you and I thank you for the privilege of sharing your word. I thank you, Lord, for those who are here to hear it because I know this is, this is not a coincidence that we're here today. This is a divine appointment. <clears throat> Just like the people we met on the streets of Gatlinburg, there were no coincidences. They were divine appointments that you had those people cross our path. And today, Father, your word and our lives cross paths here. And Father, I just pray that you'll speak to our hearts and that our hearts will turn to you by faith and you will receive glory, honor, and praise and adoration and all that is worthy of you. Heavenly Father, let it ring from our hearts and, and from our lips that the world might know that you are an awesome God. Father, take it now, take us and use us and speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. 
We live in a day when many people have forgotten about the glory and the power of Almighty God. As those who remember, uh, they're becoming fewer and fewer in Israel. Some of them did know, they saw, just like uh, Joshua did, and they know about it, but they're dying off. They're, they're, it's another generation coming on the scene. Today, the older ones of you, not me, you, right? Whoops. Well, that means God said, you better tighten up, son. You better include yourself in that old number. Okay, the older ones of us. <laughs> yeah, Lord, you do have a sense of humor. The older ones of us know that we're going to be moving on. And I just, I'm excited about that, honestly. Hate to leave you all, but, uh, you know, you're good company and all, but I just can't wait to be in God's presence. And we'll be moving on, and there's a younger generation, and then even a younger one after that that's coming along that maybe has not seen the awesome things that God has done for us in our lives and in the life of our church. They haven't seen that. They haven't experienced themselves. And so here's our, here's our tendency. If you'll think back, mature adult, if you'll think back a few years, like a decade or two or three, maybe four, and you'll think back about where you were spiritually. <clears throat> and then today, you know, we sit and we say, I wonder why those young people just don't get it. I wonder why they don't get in and read their Bible every day, just like we do now. Uh, you're retired now. <laughs> and they're still working. They still have a family to raise. But the thing is, we know we're moving on. And a younger generation is coming up. And they have not experienced what we have. And Joshua here is concerned about the people of Israel who have not experienced what he has experienced and the other leaders. And he's concerned about them. He loves them and he doesn't want them to get in a mess. We need to be reminded of the power and the glory of God. We need to tell our children and our grandchildren. We need to tell those events. I, I like I hate to use the word story, it sounds like it's fabricated, but we need to tell those stories about what God has done in our life so that others will know and others will say, hey, God really is real. I remember my mother and my grandmother or my grandparents telling me about what God did. How many of you know there's a big rock standing up out on this corner of the property? Hmm? Have you seen it? Yeah, raise your hand if you've seen it. Okay, good, I just wondered. Because if you don't see it, you might run over it with your car, you know. Okay, what about on this corner? You seen the big rock on this corner of the property? You seen that rock? Well, not y'all, the rest of you, go down there and look at that rock. There are rocks there. There are stones. They're standing up, and they're for a reason. And we put them up there and cemented them in the ground as a testimony that God has done some great things right here in this location. He's done awesome things. And we want to remember that. We want every generation to come along and look at that and say, wow, uh, my grandparents told me about the great things God did at this location, and there's a stone. And we've seen all through Joshua how Israel, <clears throat> when, they, when God did something on their behalf, uh, Joshua would say now, or God would tell Joshua, I want you to pile up some stones here. So that when your children come later from generation after generation, they say, what are these stones here for? You can tell them, God really showed out right here. Amen? And let me tell you something. We got a stone here because God really showed out right here. Our children need to be exposed <clears throat> to God's power. Within this text, we find some valuable lessons. First of all, it's... Well, here's, here's what it's all about. If we hear, hear that word? If, if you're listening, if we hear his voice and if we obey his commands, the world around us will see the glory and the power of our God at work in our church and at work in our lives as we go out these doors. Isn't that what we want? Yes, we want God to see we want the world to see God in our church. We want the word, world to see God in our lives. But what did I say? It's if you hear God. It's if we obey God. Because we can come in and out of this church house all day, and if we don't change, <clears throat> if we don't get on fire for Jesus, if we don't get uh, zealous about the things of God in our own life, do you think anybody is going to want your religion? Hello? 
I'm telling you, you go out these doors, you ought to be a walking, talking Jesus machine. Amen? You ought to be talking about what God's doing in your life all the time. <clears throat> and I might want to draw a real parenthetical little statement right here. If you don't see God doing something in your life, you maybe need to do a spiritual checkup, find out where you are with him. You say, well, I know I'm saved. That's great. <clears throat> That's great. God did not save you to sit on a chair. Amen? He didn't save you to come listen to a sermon. He saved you to serve. To serve. <coughs> Pardon me. Well, if we hear and if we obey, then the world's going to see God in us. And when this happens, you know what's going to happen? When the world sees God in us, we're going to be blessed. We're going to be a blessed people. You say, oh, that word blessed, it's kind of, it's kind of um, what's the word? It's vague. Well, let me put it this way. When the world sees Jesus in you and you are blessed, it means that you are going to be moving closer to the abundant life that Christ has for you. Jesus said, I have life, I bring life, and I bring it to you in abundance. How many of you have said, <coughs> when someone greeted you, maybe this morning, how are you, brother, sister, so-and-so? Well, I'm getting by. I'm getting by. That don't sound like abundant life to me. We go out in the world, and someone says, how are you today? Oh, let me tell you, oh, I've had a week, my back aches, and had to, got this letter from uh, the doctor, you know, and he said this, and then I got a bill from the doctor, and he said that, and, and oh, I'm just, oh, woe is me. I don't serve a God like that, amen? I serve a God that when I get the letter from the doctor, I look at it and I say, Jesus, what you going to do about this? <laughs> I need a little help here, you know, whether it's medical, whether it's financial, whatever it is. The world is looking for God in all the wrong places. And we need to be the light in our communities, in our worlds, and in our neighborhoods, on our jobs, in our families, that says, that people look at it and they say, hmm, I'd like to have some of that. Yeah. I, 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 why are they always smiling? Why do they always seem happy? I remember a time when Two airplanes crashed into the World Trade Centers. On that morning, we were at Tallahassee Community College. And we were part of the, she was staff and I was faculty. And, and we had about, gosh, there must have been 50 people in our department. And everybody was running around like crazy. Oh, 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 oh. Sky's falling. Well, the airplanes did anyway. And we were, everybody was saying, why, why are you not all upset? And we say, we are concerned. Very concerned, but we know that God in heaven is in charge. Amen? He's in charge. And so it's not like the airplanes or the terrorists are in charge. God is in charge. And so we're not fretting. And we don't fret when things happen in our lives and, and it seems like the sky is falling and we look around and people are just shaking in their boots and they're saying, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you shaking in your boot? Because my boots got God laces. <laughs> They're tied up real tight and snug. I'm dug in for the long haul. And, uh, and I'm just, I'm fixed in Jesus, you see. And so it doesn't matter what happens around me. I know who I serve and I know who's in charge. And, hello. I read the back of the book and we win. Amen. Oh, glory to God. Today we look at Joshua's concerns for Israel. He nears the time of his departure. His life's almost over. And he sees some changes occurring in the lives of his people that he is not really happy about. He's, he's concerned. Because he's seeing how people are starting to change. They're getting settled into the promised land. And as I look at the Bible each week, I see the error of God's people. After, after examining my own life... I, I present the best I can to you the error of God's people in the past so we don't fall into the same sins of complacency and compromise as did Israel. You see, the Bible presents the commands of God, the failures of God's people, and the consequences of those sins. I want to say that again. The Bible presents to us the commands of God, the failures of God's people, and the consequences of God's people's sins. 
Joshua fears his people are going to go the wrong way, and he's only got a short time to tell them about it. So first of all, he fears their complacency towards God. In verse 6, it says, be strong. He encourages them, be strong. But look what he says next. You know, we've read, be strong and courageous. That's what we know about Joshua. He says that, be strong, be courageous. But look what he says here. Be strong and be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning to the left or to the right. Carl and I talk a lot, and he says, I say, okay, Carl, I'll see you later. And he says something like, okay, keep it between the bar ditches. He's from Texas. I don't know what a bar ditch is in Mississippi, but I prefer to keep it on the blacktop, amen? And he says, keep it between the bar ditches. In other words, on your journey, don't turn to the left or turn to the right. You're going to get in trouble. And so when, when he says, be careful to obey, isn't that what this relationship with God is all about? First of all, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we're saved. <clears throat> Some people say, I'm secure, and I am. I'm secure in what Christ has done for me. But then I need to look at what God says to me as his child, and he tells me to obey. And Joshua here is talking to the people, and he says, be strong, and, but be careful to obey all that is written. In other words, everything that God has said that Moses wrote down. And do not <clears throat> turn, do not turn. You get off the wrong path. Joshua is afraid that the people of Israel might begin to take the law of God for granted. And if there's anything that I think we do sometimes is we just take God for granted. We live in a wonderful country. We have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to go here, go there. I went clear to Tennessee. I went through Mississippi. I went through Alabama. I went through Georgia. I went through Tennessee. I didn't have to show my passport not one time. So we have a lot of freedoms, and we take them for granted. We need not take the law of God for granted. <clears throat> he was afraid they might become complacent in their walk with the Lord and begin to let things slide a little bit. To start embracing, oh, I'll take a little bit of this. Well, <clears throat> and it reminds me of my favorite illustration, I suppose, because it's so real and it's so apparent, it's so local, is going to the casinos. A friend of mine that when I was in Hattiesburg, he lived in Hattiesburg, and, and um, he'd be going down to the casino, and he'd, he'd say, you know, I'm just going down there for the food, because they got that seafood buffet for, I think it was like, this was years ago, like $4.95 for a seafood buffet. And I'm thinking, man, my mouth is watering. Lo wrong location, though, wrong location. You see, we start saying, well, it's okay to go down to the casino if I'm going to eat. Hello, you're supporting the casino. Well, it's okay to go over here just to do this, but you're supporting wherever you're going. And, and let me remind you of this. Wherever you go, Christian, you're taking Jesus. You're dragging him along with you, wherever you're going. Whatever you're doing, and you know, when we sin, <laughs> isn't it interesting how, how we sin and we think, <clears throat> God, you just stay over there right now because I'm going to do this, and I know you ain't going to like it, but I'm just drawn to it, and I just got to do this. And uh, then I'll come back and get you, God, as soon as I'm done. Do you think God works like that? You drag him right along into the gutter of your sin. Think about that next time you're making choices. <clears throat> well, tragically, Joshua was right, and that's exactly what happened to Israel. They, they went in a bar ditch. <clears throat> it's my conviction that the sins of complacency and apathy are among the most common and devastating sins that exist among the people of God today. Complacency and apathy. We allow ourselves to adopt a Laodicean attitude of Revelation chapter 3. You remember that? We become satisfied with our spiritual condition. I go to church. I sing in the choir. I play an instrument. I teach Sunday school. Or I'm just regular at church. <clears throat> and so I'm good. Remember, psychologists said, oh, you're good, I'm good, we're all good, we look at each other, we compare ourselves to each other, we're fine. And if, if you're a lot better than I am, then I'll find myself another standard to compare myself to, so I still look good. 
don't we hang around with people like ourselves? <clears throat> Which reminds me of what my mother-in-law said and probably applies here to some degree. If you lay down with dogs, you're going to get up with fleas. Amen? Well, wherever you go, it's going to have an influence on you. Revelation chapter 3 talks about <clears throat> us being or allowing issues to go unchallenged in our lives that are leading us away from God into sin, like the Laodiceans. <clears throat> By the way, the Laodiceans, uh, their water supply was interesting. They had from, from uh, ice-cold, cool, crisp, refreshing water for, that came down uh, from Colossae, and uh, that was for drinking, and oh, that was so good in Colossae. You go to Colossae and you get the cool, crisp, chilled water. And you, and you go over to uh, Hierapolis and you get the, the hot bath water. You know, it's kind of steamy, like uh, spring bath, hot springs. <clears throat> and so Laodicea being in between, they made these aqueducts and uh, they brought that cool water from Colossae and, and the Hierapolis, the hot water, they brought it in to Laodicea. And by the time it made the trek, by the time it came down the aqueducts, the cool water was kind of like ugh, hot, warm. It wasn't, who wants to drink that? Di Diane was telling me, she says, I try to take my pills. I've got to have cold something. I can't drink hot water. It, it makes me sick on my stomach. And then from, <clears throat> from uh, Hierapolis, they had the hot springs water, good for baths and all that. It's great. And, in Hierapolis, and it comes down through the aqueduct, and by the time it gets to Laodicea, it's kind of not much different from the lukewarm water that was cold and crisp, now hot springs, it's lukewarm. And what did Jesus say about this? By the time each of them <clears throat> reached Laodicea, they'd become lukewarm, not good for drinking or for hot baths. And Jesus says in verse 16 of chapter 3 of Revelation, because you are lukewarm... Neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. King James uses the word spew, which is, I think, a little more refined than spit. But let me tell you what it actually means in the Greek is I'm going to vomit you up. You're so disgusting to me. This is Jesus speaking. Well, I don't want to be in a lukewarm church. I'd rather be hot or cold, like Jesus said, but I don't want to be lukewarm. It makes Jesus sick to his stomach to see lukewarm Christians, because they're not doing anything. Oh, they come to church, they sit in the church pews, they may sing, but as far as doing anything for the kingdom, nothing. I hope you're not a Laodicean Christian. Just like this water, the modern church is neither refreshing like a cool drink of water, nor is she stimulating like a hot bath. For the most part, listen to me, and I'm not talking just about grace, I'm talking about every church, and I'll just speak of America, every church in America, the majority of that church is probably lukewarm. The majority. In fact, if you take a survey, which uh, many have done, they've surveyed church members, and they find out about, well, what ministry are you involved in? Do you tithe? Do you support this? What function do you have in the church? Uh, how do you participate? And they find, listen, that only 3% of the people give 97% of the money. 3% give 97% of the money. That means the other 90-something percent give 3% of the money. Okay? So that's sad in itself. And then if you look on ministry, you find out that only a handful of people in any particular church, a small percentage, are actually involved in doing the Lord's work in some way or other. They're not doing anything for God. They're not doing missions. They're not doing uh, working with the elderly. They're not promoting the gospel. They're not feeding the hungry. They're just coming and going from church. Pick y'all's feet up if you need to. In our complacency, we no longer strive to serve the Lord. We don't strive to send the lost. And, and we don't really live holy, consecrated lives to the glory of God. What we do is we do church. We're satisfied with doing church. God didn't say, I want you to do church. What did he say? I want you to be 
church. I want you to be the church. We may be in church, but we are. St- our question is, are we still excited that we're saved? Are we excited to come to worship? <clears throat> Do we come in and say, well, well yeah, we kind of like to go to church, and when we get here, we want to sit, and, and I wish they wouldn't sing so many songs because I get tired of standing up, and I get tired of singing. I just, just let me hear the preacher, and then we'll do our do, and we'll go home, or actually we'll go eat. Because probably right now, about this time of the morning, your stomach may be growling. Just to, How many got growling stomachs? I'll be honest. Uh-huh, I see some sands. Yeah, mine too. And I have to tell it, flesh, get in your place. This is not the time for you to eat. Amen? You don't know how often I stand here and preach, and my stomach is rumbling around saying, are we going to eat yet? Is it time to eat yet? You don't know what goes on up here on this side of the pulpit. It's crazy, trust me. So we, are we excited about knowing Jesus? Are we excited about the salvation that we have in Christ? Are we excited about coming and reading the Bible and learning about it and, and worshiping God? Or are we self-centered, self-satisfied and complacent in our spiritual condition? I'm good, Brother Stan. You know, I got saved when I was young, or I got saved last week, and and I'm here, and I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Go ahead, finish your sermon so I can go eat. I'm good. Okay. Complacent is a dangerous place to be. It's a dangerous place to find yourself. Joshua was not only concerned with them becoming complacent, but in their newfound prosperity in the promised land, he fears that they're comp- they may compromise with the world. His concern that people of Israel will go after the dead gods of Canaan and they'll become content in just going to church. He is rightly concerned they will compromise their standards, they will bow down to idols, they will take foreign gods and foreign wives We see the history of Israel, and we don't compare it to our own lives. And if we would, we would think, well, I don't need to be doing this over here, because I see what Israel did, and I see what it cost them. Oh, my gosh. I think I need to get back over here where I'm supposed to be. So the question is, what about us? Aren't we just as guilty as Israel? Have not the people of God given their affection to other gods? Certainly many worship the God of self. <clears throat> the God of self. Remember the sermon I did on the selfie? The selfie sermon? Oh, wasn't that good? Look how, how, if I get this camera right here, I get a good picture of me. Because it's all about me. And I'm going to post it on my Facebook so everybody can see me. Well, <clears throat> I wish that I could get a picture of God. I mean, I'll just... Get a beautiful cloud up in the sky, and you know how you can read faces in the clouds? And I'll just snap that picture, and I'll put it on Facebook and say, this is God's imitation look. You know, this is his new hairdo. Praise God, not us. So many Christians today worship gods of self and success and materialism and money and even more. Truth is, many Christians who go to church regularly are guilty of compromise in in their own lives. Now I'm talking about them, not talking about us, talking about them, those... Okay, it happens to us too, doesn't it? We get consumed with success or money or education or recreation or whatever Asian that you might get consumed with. But we need to separate ourselves from the world and the things of the world and get our priorities back. We need to keep the main thing the main thing. We allow ourselves to indulge in activities that we know God disapproves of or at best are questionable. Are questionable. Someone asked me one time, it's been years ago, nobody this week, okay, it's been years ago, somebody asked me, well, is it okay if I do so-and-so? And I said, you're asking me, is it okay? And they said, yeah. I said, probably not then. Because if you got to ask, is this okay to do? It's probably not. Does that make any sense? I mean, when I look at going to church, I don't ask myself, I wonder if it's okay if I go to church today. I wonder if it's okay if I go to Bible study or, you know, 
I wonder if it's okay if I go over to some other Christian's house and we sit around and drink coffee and talk about God. Is, is that okay? Is that, that's not even questionable. But when it is questionable, when you have to ask, is this, I wonder if this is okay if I do, or mm, I wonder if God's looking when I do this, then it's probably not okay. We do things that we know are wrong and we try to justify it by saying, well, so-and-so does it. In fact, so-and-so in the church, I've seen them do it. So isn't that okay with me? And we do it all while we sing, oh, how I love Jesus, such a hollow ring in God's ears. Amen? Y'all are quiet this morning. Okay, I've been gone to Tennessee and, and I got revived, amen? I guess. Amen. It was good. It was really good. We need to avoid the trap of compromise. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 draws a line in the sand of compromise when it says, abstain from all appearances of evil. Reject, avoid every kind of evil in the NIV. <clears throat> avoid even the appearance of evil. Let, let me ask you a question. What does that do for a Christian with Halloween? When we were in Tennessee this past week, I saw all kinds of Halloween stuff. I mean, you go into stores and they got these big, goofy looking things. Even some of the local stores won't call their name in Gulfport. We go in and, and we see these big, extravagant witches with, they got fans blowing their costumes up and just really looking evil. What does the Bible say? <clears throat> it reminds me of, this is not a story, this is a true event. I was at uh, my church in Florida, my first church, and, and I, was, um, <clears throat> I was preaching, and God just told me, preach on Halloween. Tell them the evils of Halloween. So I did the research on Halloween, and it's on our website if you'd like to go look at it. Go under more, under resources, and you can read about Halloween, the history of it. I'm not going there this morning, but I will say this. After I preached on Halloween, a deacon... The next week, I might add, not that day, the next week came to me and he said, Brother Stan, you know you preached on Halloween last week? I said, yeah. He says, well, God convicted me. I went home and I took down all the witches and everything and the ghosts and goblins I had in my yard and on my front door and in my house. I, I got rid of all of them. I said, good for you. Because the Bible says, God says, avoid even the appearance of evil. So we do, Christians, we are held to a higher standard. Yes, we are. And we are to walk a walk that someone doesn't look and question what we're doing. Somebody doesn't say, well, it says he's a Christian. Look where he went. Look how he talks. Look what he just said. Look what he thinks. Look how he's, or she, or she is dressing as a Christian. Amen? We need to avoid this trap of compromise. When we dwell in the land of complacency and compromise, it always affects our commitment, always. <clears throat> Joshua fears for their commitment to the Lord. So he fears that they will not cling to the Lord as they should. And from the pages of Israel's history, we can see that Joshua was right to be concerned. He was absolutely right. He was concerned about them, yeah, because he knew them. <clears throat> Our nature, too, is to drift away from God. When it happens, we are oftentimes under, unaware that we're drifting. You know, we do it so subtly, little by little, that we don't realize that we've actually moved away from God. There was a book written one time, the title of it was Frog in the Kettle. It was talking about how you want to boil frogs. Well, you don't heat the water up, get it boiling, and throw the frogs in. Because the frogs ain't stupid, they jump out. But you can deceive the frogs and put the frogs in the cold water and then build the fire under it and heat it slowly and they don't even realize they're being boiled to death. Sin is like that. We get a little bit here and we get a little more here. We don't realize how far we've moved away from God until we're being boiled to death by sin itself. As with complacency and compromise, there's a word here for the church. As in all churches today, it's painfully obvious <clears throat> that commitment of many is not where it should be. Let's be honest. 
Commitment of many is not where it should be. You know, we had, uh, we had a work day up here. Well, kind of a work day. It was supposed to be a men's ministry work day, and I'm going to tell on us men. <clears throat> and uh, we announced it, but only a couple of people showed up. In fact, two of them were women. <laughs> and the five of us did all the work that we needed to get done. Thank God we got it done. I appreciate everybody that did come, coming and working. But where is our commitment anymore? Now, some of you told me, you know, Carl got the thingy jigger in there to make him, like, stay on track, and uh, the pacemaker. And, and some of you said, well, we need to come help Carl cut the grass. And I appreciate you doing that. That's great. Don't stop there. Amen? Don't stop there. Carl, I know, appreciates us cutting the gra- helping cut the grass. He's getting back on his feet <clears throat> and doing a good job again. But we can still come alongside and help him. But we can also do a lot of other things around the church, can't we? We can just come in and, you know, people come in and they say, well, why didn't you tell me you didn't have anybody to clean the bathrooms this week? Well, I just don't have time to call you and tell you the bathrooms need to be cleaned. Excuse me. I have some other things on my top priority list to do as pastor than keep up with things like that. Hey, I got a grand idea. Why don't the church members check the bathrooms? Amen. Am I getting too, uh, you need to pick your feet up higher? Okay. So we'll move on. We need commitment in God's house, in God's church, and not just about physical. We had one church member that uh, she had to leave and, and go back up north while we went on a Tennessee trip, but I miss her on that Tennessee trip because she <clears throat> is a witnessing machine on the streets. She gives out more bracelets. I remember the first time I took her down to the homeless to do homeless thing on Christmas, give out homeless bags at Christmas, <clears throat> and we, we were giving out cards, that, uh, the orange death life card that Brother Don gives us a lot, and uh, we were giving them out on the street, and she said, look, there's a bar, and there's people in there. Uh, should we go in there and give them death life card? And I thought, well, I don't know if we really ought to go in the bars. And uh, she said, and, and I looked, and she's already gone. She didn't care. So she's in the bar witnessing and giving them death life cards. And honestly, kind of shook me up a little bit. And I said, you know, Stan, you need to get with the program. You need to minister to everybody. Amen. And uh, it was 9 o'clock in the morning, so they probably weren't soused and they could understand English. But I wouldn't go in there at 9 o'clock at night, obviously. <clears throat> so, where are we at? Commitment. Our churches. Let me, let me tell you what Jesus says about commitment in Matthew 10. In verse 37, anyone, listen closely, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up my cross and follow me, take up their cross, I'm sorry, and follow me is not worthy of me. Boy, you want it straight, just look in the scriptures. Amen? We are not worthy of Christ if we love our parents, our children, more than we love God. Does that, does, is God saying in one place, the Bible says, if you don't hate mother and father, blah, 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 well, you know, you've got to take it in context. What Jesus is saying is, do you love me more than anything else? Do you love me more than your spouse? Do you love me more than your children? Do you love me more than your siblings? Do you love me more than your life? Can I get amen? amen. Then Jesus says, follow me. Not do church. Not just be a nice looking good person he said follow me where did jesus go he went down the dusty roads of galilee and capernaum and philippi he went to these places and he talked to people he met people on the streets or the paths if you will in his day and time do you see what jesus is saying here he's telling us very clearly if he's not number one in our hearts and our lives then we're not worthy to follow him In other words, if we have a religion, but we don't have a relationship with Christ, we're not worthy to follow Him. Because our religion does not draw us close to God. In fact, religion, I believe, is a downfall of man. 
Because you can go around the world and you can look at all kinds of religions that all the people heading to hell. We need a relationship with the God who created us. And that is the only way we can have eternal life. According to Jesus, the ultimate expression of love for him is in the willingness to bear one's cross. Simply put, this means that you're willing to make a total commitment. A total commitment. Say that with me. Total commitment. So looking at your life today, how would you describe your commitment to Jesus? Don't answer out loud. Just think about it for a minute. What's my, is my life totally committed to Jesus? Or am I kind of consumed in this area and do Jesus on the side? You know, <clears throat> I think Diane has a t-shirt. It says, a little bit of coffee, my morning starts or something like that, or a great morning is a little bit of coffee and a whole lot of Jesus. All I need is a little bit of coffee and a whole lot of Jesus. Amen. And that's true at lunch, and it's true in evening time, too. We need a whole lot of Jesus. Joshua had a legitimate concern about the people of Israel becoming complacent and compromising with the indigenous people of Canaan and their continued commitment to God who had given them the promised land now. And then they just... They're charging in. God is fighting for them. They're, uh, they're pushing out and destroying all of the evil enemies against them and against God. They're destroying by the power of God. <clears throat> and now, guess what's happened? It's all over. They've conquered the land. There's a few tribes here and there. They've got to clean up. But they're in the land. And now, okay, God, thank you for helping me, bringing me through Katrina bringing me through hurricanes, bringing me through these hard times in my life. Thank you, God. Now, if you just go sit right over here and be complacent and, and just chill out, I'll call you when I need you again. Church, that's what's happening in too many of our lives. God needs to be in the forefront of our life through thick and thin, good times, bad times. He needs to be what our life is all about. We often have to attend the school of hard knocks when instead we should look at the Bible and learn from Israel's downfalls and their experience so that we learn not to drift away from God but to cling to the Lord.